Welcome back to the Sip and Feast podcast. This is episode number 33. Today we are talking about food secret weapons. What exactly do I mean here, Tara? Actually, I was going to ask you. Okay, well then What I'll... do you mean, Jim? <laughs> then what I are will food tell you. secret weapons? <laughs> then I will tell you, Tara. Okay, so what I mean is these are things that you should have. I recommend you have most of the time for cooking. They can be add-ons that you put in at the end. They can be things to really just boost the flavor of a lot of your dishes. And many of them, they might know, Tara, but I think we'll, what I intend to do here is put a little bit, maybe a spin on it, where maybe they're not using the ingredients as effectively as they could. Right. So they you're calling them secret weapons. They may not be the ingredients themselves aren't so secret, but it's really the application of the ingredients that's more of a secret. Is that right? That's right. The basically the democratization of food instruction has made it so everyone knows or can know everything about food. It's all at your fingertips. The internet, mm -hmm. cooking videos, Everything is there for the consumer, and the ingredients are in so many more places than they were even 20 years ago. Yeah, that's true. But with all that info and ingredients and every, the whole shebang at your fingertips, maybe still, well, the question is, why are people not getting the results maybe that they desire? So- it could be something as simple as an ingredient that you think needs to be used one way mm -hmm. should be used in a different way. Yeah. All right. So we're going to get into these secret weapons. These aren't in any particular order. Tara, you want to like take control of the list and sure. maybe I'll talk about them. Feel free to jump in if you think I'm not describing it in the correct way or if you think that I'm missing a particular mm -hmm. way to use it. All right. Yeah. So first up, Calabrian chili or cherry peppers. So these are, again, not, they, these are relatively known now, mm -hmm. okay? I think most people who fancy themselves a cook, an experienced cook, know what these ingredients are. Now, you know, being able to access them, maybe not as easy in all parts of the country, but Amazon, again, mm -hmm. you know, uh, puts, it, puts it at the fingertips of anybody really in the United States. Yeah. Cherry peppers, I like to use while cooking, but I also love to use them in their raw state too. Mm -hmm. When would you use them uh, for cooking and versus when would you use them in their raw state, Tara? Well, for cooking, I would use them in like an arrabbiata type of sauce, right? Or maybe like uh, the cherry, cherry tomato pepper spread. Yeah, or broccoli, you know, just a regular broccoli rob uh, sausage pasta, which is very so typical. I would put, I wouldn't cook it in with that. I would put it on top raw. That's I, how I would do it. I like to do, I like to do it both ways for that dish. The real application where I would use them raw is like on a sandwich. Sandwich, right? Yeah, like an Italian hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Calabrian chilies, I think, can do a lot of the same work that a cherry pepper can. Uh, Calabrian chilies are smokier. Yeah, and. They are, I think, better cooked in cooked things than, though I use it all the time, like I put the spread on stuff afterwards, mm -hmm. but where they excel would be like in like a vodka sauce. It would be really nice to use mm -hmm. it. So it gets like a smoky vodka sauce you almost. You used it in the, did you use that in the shrimp vodka sauce that shrimp you made? Shrimp vodka sauce, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. good. Yeah, the popular place, uh, Carbone, they have a spicy vodka sauce that, that uses Calabrian chilies. So what makes it a secret weapon for you? I think with those, you can use them in a variety of different ways. You can buy them whole, mm -hmm. which are really nice if you want like a really big kick of heat, put like a whole one on sandwich, or you could buy like a paste of them, or you could buy them dried. So when you have them dried, essentially you're, it's like you could just mash them up and have chili flakes mm -hmm. that everybody uses to cook with. So that there's like a variety of ways to go about using them. They all have, I think, better use cases depending on what you're going for. Yeah. But I mean, si simply I think putting them like pureeing them in a sauce is a really good way to go about it. Okay. 
What else do you think? Uh, would what would you use with use for them? I like the Calabrian chili pepper spread specifically with eggs. Yeah, I think it goes really well with eggs. So I would kind of consider that a secret weapon of mine. Like if I want to make the kids like an egg sandwich or something, adding that to it. They might not be able to pinpoint exactly what it is on it, but you're just like, oh, that's really good. To me, that's what a secret weapon is. If you're like, oh, yeah, there's something in it's like that. like the smokiness of it. That tastes so yeah. good. I just don't know what it is. That's that's what I think I so like it's it for. smokiness. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the most iconic dishes that we forgot was- Assassin's Pasta. Assassin's Pasta, pasta yeah. you know, from uh, Bari, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that one, again- you could use pretty much any type of formulation there. You could use the paste. You could use the whole ones in a pinch. You could use the dried ones. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next ingredient. Olive oil, like different types of olive oil. And when, like, when would you use the different types, right? So maybe you cook with olive oil, but then maybe that's where it ends. You just use it to, say, saute your onions or your garlic, and that's the end of it. But I like to have about, th well, I don't like, I do, you have three types of olive oil on hand. Mm -hmm. I always have an inexpensive olive oil that is for cooking, for doing that sauteing, maybe even for frying cutlets or meatballs or whatever. Then I have an extra virgin that is a much better quality. So I always would say like Partana would be that brand. Mm -hmm. And that one pulls double duty. I will sometimes cook with it. I will sometimes finish it with, with it. And then I have an olive oil, which is? Frantoia. Frantoia Barbera, and that one I universally just finish with. I like to put it, a nice drizzle of it on, say, a pasta dish. So say you're doing like uh, aglio olio, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have your oil, you do your emuls emulsification, your you little flip flippy flip, and then at the end you could put on a little bit more of that really good extra virgin. Mm -hmm. Just like a drizzle. So no heat is hitting it or anything, and it's mm -hmm. just giving you that like burst at the end. Or maybe you do a good lentil soup and, you know, you cooked with your regular olive oil or maybe your partana, but then you're serving a bowl of it and you put a nice grating of Parmesan on top and then a beautiful drizzle of the Frantoia. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what other uses? Salad, obviously, right? Yeah. Although for salad, I tend to use like a less expensive um, extra virgin. I wouldn't, I don't always use the Frantoia in it. What I would use the Frantoia on is like the orange and fennel salad. Mm. So that I feel like needs that drizzle of Delicious. the really, really good extra virgin olive oil. Yeah. So I would use it for that. It's I, I would use it the same way you would. I would just use it for finishing and like kicking up yep. whatever dish you want. Like when you want to add like a little bit of, it's fresh is what it tastes like to me. It's like a little bit of freshness, like springtime. It's am I describing that right? Well, you're talking about Frantoia is fresh. Mm -hmm. I think Frantoia is is smooth, but it is strong in yeah. my opinion. But it has like that. I, I I'm I'm saying it tastes like springtime to me. Am I using or grassy maybe? I don't. So again, everybody has a different interpretation of what these oils taste mm -hmm. like. I would say Frantoia slides more towards the peppery scale. I mean, it's a it's a Sicilian olive oil. Yeah. All Sicilian extra virgins to my palate seem to be strong, mm -hmm. but there's a whole range of those Sicilian extra virgin olive oils. Partana is a Sicilian oil, so yeah. it's like I'm recommending both of them. We actually filmed it and we never published it. We did an olive oil taste test mm -hmm. and we had 10 bottles of extra virgin olive oils and we actually had one that was super expensive Yeah, in a little tiny bottle. And that was from Sicily also, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so that video is sitting in the archives. It's sitting in the archives. I'm probably gonna publish it. I'm not sure though. Uh, at the point now where I can't even give the footage to my editor because I don't know if I did something silly in the video or whatnot. And it's, <laughs> uh, seriously, seriously, I don't know. Like sometimes I will have videos where I'm like, oh, Jim, you need to edit that one yourself, you know? <laughs> I don't even know. It's been so long. And if I'm going to go through 65 minutes of footage, I might as well just edit the darn thing myself. Yeah. But I looked at it the other day and I was like, oh God. I was like, Tara, I don't even know if I remember how to edit that well anymore. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Okay. Different types of salt. Salts. Okay. Actually, this is a great, this is a great segue because with that delicious orange salad, 
with your Sicilian extra virgin, you will put on, by the way, that salad is a Sicilian salad. Mm -hmm. So then you put on the nice flaky sea salt. So now salts have all different applications. Do you have fine salts that are good for, say you're making, I don't know, say you're making pizza dough. You're going to want a fine salt. You're not going to want a thick, chunky salt that's not going to melt. But say you're, or say you're making a soup and you want everything to dissolve, just use, you know, fine sea salt. But say you have a steak, you know, beautiful piece of prime rib. We actually did this. I had the Malden salt in the, mm -hmm. in the picture. So really big chunks and you put a few of them on there or you do a nice filet for someone and you sprinkle a couple of those salt specks. Like basically you put it, bring it to the table and they're still not melting yet. Yeah, That's the thing about it. But yeah, that same type of salt you would put on that orange salad. Mm -hmm. Now that's not even getting into the flavored salts that people do. There's a whole yeah. bunch of YouTube cooks that sell their flavored salts. Mm -hmm. You know, like how old YouTubers used to sell merch? Yeah. They'd be like, we're doing a merch drop. Now these these cooking channels do a salt, they do a salt drop. They're like, we got like a, like I got 500 orders of my rosemary salt. You want to get in on it. And so they build a sense of urgency and uh, scarcity. Yeah. And they get the people to buy it. Is it just like salt mixed with dried herbs? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. I don't know. We don't have any of those products yet for you. We're working on them. Lots of them. No. I don't know. <laughs> not really. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, listen, I'm not resistant to it. I just don't, I don't really see the, the point of, of that one. If I had like a good product that I thought was worth it, I think, then an, I would I think it. an olive oil would be good. Yeah. But I mean, what are we going to do? Like, I'm going to buy, like, you have to like contract, like, with the whole, with the, the farm. You got to buy like 10,000 bottles of it. Yeah. You know, that's true. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, so this is your list. These are not my items. I was surprised to see this. MSG? <laughs> what? In a nutshell here, MSG is used by so many young cooks now on TikTok. Really? Yes, yes. Okay, people who are over about 40, they just, we've been indoctrinated into thinking that MSG is horrible for you. And there's really nothing that can dispel to us that it's not bad for us. Even when you walk into all Chinese restaurants around here, not all of them, about half of them, especially the kitchens, there will be a sign that yeah, says no, what? No, no MSG. No MSG, yeah. okay? So it's, and so I, again, I had to do research on this a little bit. This really got popularized in, I think the 60s or 70s, where it was like, it wasn't really peer reviewed science. It basically said that it can have a couple bad effects on you, but there's been so much further uh, current research on it. A lot of, uh, what's it called when you look at all different studies? Is that a meta-analysis, right? So it's basically showing that there's nothing wrong with using it in small amounts. And a lot of places that you eat at use it, Chick-fil-A being one of them. Okay. okay. McDonald's doesn't use it. Mm -hmm. So that's from my research. McDonald's doesn't, Chick fil A does. Is it a flavor enhancer? Yes. Isn't it a salt? It's glutamic acid. Is it a salt? It's a salt. I, I'm going to read this to you because this is MSG is short for monosodium glutamate. That I knew. So when okay. I heard sodium, that's what makes yeah. me think it's a salt. So I'll just read this here. Yeah. It's a flavor enhancer derived from L -glut glutamic acid, which is naturally present in many foods. L glutamic acid. Acid is a non-essential amino acid, meaning that your body can produce it by itself and doesn't need to get it from food. MSG is a white odorless crystalline powder commonly used as a food additive. In the food industry, it's known as E621. It dissolves easily in water, separating into sodium and free glutamate. Okay, It's made by fermenting carb sources like sugar beet, sugarcane, and molasses. There's no chemical difference between glutamic acid found naturally in some foods and that found in MSG. This means your body can't differentiate between the two sources. MSG has a specific taste known as umami. It is the fifth basic taste alongside sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Umami has a meaty flavor that refers to the presence of proteins in food. Besides MSG, other umami compounds include inosine 5 which is IMP, or guanosine 5 monophosphate, which is GMP. 
MSG is a popular is popular in Asian cooking and used in various processed foods in the West. It's estimated that people's average daily intake is 0.3 to 1 grams. It's a flavor enhancer. It goes on and on. This was from I got to find I'm going to put it right across here what where we got this from because this comes from an article on from Healthline, okay? So I was just reading verbatim from the Healthline article. Now the Healthline article is what was an article written on it. The basic bottom line here from my understanding and I'm not a scientist is that MSG in small doses is totally fine. It it's in a lot of foods. It's like it's in Parmesan cheese. It's in a lot of cheeses. So when would you use it? If you're if you're going to say that this is one of your secret weapons because I don't recall a time where you've do we even have MSG? No, we don't. I'm and I want to just include this here because I don't use it in my cooking, but when I do do a chicken uh fried chicken sandwich, mm -hmm. a la Chick-fil-A or Popeyes or whatever, I am going to add MSG to it. Again, my understanding is Chick-fil-A that's what they use. Hmm, interesting. So they use that and a couple, um, people have speculated there's a couple other things that are in that marinade. Mm -hmm. Like they come, the chicken comes brined. Yeah. Then they bread it and they fry it. I mean, they're frying it in a, pe a pressure fryer, which mm -hmm. obviously, you know, a home doesn't have a pressure fryer, but I will just fry it in a Dutch oven pot. Interesting. Yeah. Let us know what you think. I would go out and venture, I would venture to guess if you are over 40 and if you are over 50 and you're listening to this, you are probably terrified of MSG. And I think you probably had family members who told you when they eat MSG, it gives them headaches. That was the thing with the Chinese food back in that period of time. It said that it would give you headaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I remember hearing. Or it made you like really tired. Like my mom had a, I think it was like Christmas or Thanksgiving dinner once and somebody, somebody's husband fell asleep on the couch, passed out and they accused my mom of using MSG in her, in her food. And I was like, oh, maybe it was like the, you know, two bottles of wine the person drank that made, that made the false Yeah, steak. yeah, that might have something to do with it. I'll just finish, <laughs> I'll finish up here just a little bit. It says it's a flavor enhancer. Um, it's due to its umami taste, which induces salivary secretion. In other words, umami flavors make your mouth water, which can improve the taste of food. What's more, studies show that umami substances can lower the desire to salt foods. Salt is another flavor enhancer. In fact, some research postulates that replacing some salt with MSG can reduce people's sodium intake by approximately 3%. Similarly, MSG may be used as a salt substitute in low sodium products like soups, prepackaged meals, cold cuts, and dairy products. It, from, from what I read, it's in all those products. Wow. So everything you're buying like that comes in it. I really think that Chinese food got the bad end of the stick, short end of the stick here, because they were the ones that had to put on their sign in their kitchen when you come in, no MSG used. Yeah. But you never you would never go to a McDonald's and see no yeah. MSG used. So wow. That's so interesting. Let's move on. All right. Anchovies. Speaking of umami. Yeah, so anchovies are awesome ingredient. I use them often when I am cooking Italian food, though they can be used in other cuisines. But basically, other cuisines will use fish sauce, which is which is a substitute for anchovies. So any recipe that Italian recipe, say you just cook a ton of Asian food and you just have a lot of those ingredients in your home and you don't have a lot of the typical Italian ingredients. If you're making an Italian dish, you can easily substitute fish sauce mm -hmm. for the anchovies. Yeah, I could see that. So I use a little bit. They add an umami flavor. Uh, I put them in the riso al forno, which is a Sicilian interpretation of the dish the way I made it. Though I think it comes from Malta, they say, which is you know an island off the coast there. Um, I put them in just regular sauces that I do. I mm -hmm. put them in my clam sauce. I put them in a lot they of really stuff. They really are a secret weapon because I think so So many times people don't realize that there are anchovies in whatever it is that you've made. Yeah. Yeah, but I you can like, like not tell the kids though. They get they get mad sometimes when they hear I'm putting, hear James, that I put them in there. James, does, he'll eat a, a whole anchovy. He doesn't mind. Sammy then, yeah. Yeah. And they're of course in what dressing? Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. Can you make Caesar dressing without anchovies? Yeah, you can. It's not going to be as good, but you can. That's like 
It's like making a pizza without cheese. Yeah, but you, you can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. You can do yeah. anything. I you can know. do anything that you want. I know. You right? can. You're right. You can. Okay. Let's move. Acids. You have acids on here. So acids are quickly would be lemon juice, wine, vinegar. That's right. Those would be the three most common ones. And when I'm referring to acids, that's what I mean. I even though tomatoes are an acid, they're not as strong as those. So those acids would be used to basically brighten a dish. Say you make like a rice and you want to just kick it up right at the end. So you're making like, yeah, an Asian dish. You're making like fried rice or whatever. You could do a little squeeze of lime juice at the end will really brighten it up. Or I think Chipotle does that for their white for their rice, right? It always has like mm -hmm. lime in it. Acids like wine would be to cook with, but you can also use a touch more at the end, which would which would boost it even more. And what was the other one that we were saying? We said vinegar. So vinegar, you like to put in uh, in your soups and stuff at the end. Lentil soup. Yeah. I, I like to add vinegar yeah. to it. I, I don't think I would really add it to other soups, but you could. Yeah, vinegar is a great ingredient. Like it's in, uh, Tara likes it in, in the lentil soup, but in chicken scarparillo, it's delicious. It's like yeah. a vinegar chicken. Now there yeah. are recipes just for straight vinegar chicken that are really good too. That's so good. It's very pungent. It's it's actually hard to cook because you have to open the windows because the vinegar can like hurt your eyes. Yeah, almost. and the same thing when you're cooking or with not the cherry. Hurt, but like irritate, like onion type irritation. Yeah. And like when you cook with cherry peppers, because the cherry peppers, the jarred ones always come in vinegar. Once you put them in the pan, they it just goes up yeah. your nose immediately. And actually chicken scarparillo doesn't just have vinegar. It also has the cherry peppers mm -hmm. in it. So it has both of them in that dish. Okay, next is herbs. Herbs. I use a lot of herbs to finish dishes. I think that's when you want to use them, whether you're making a roast chicken, whether you're making a pasta, whether you're making a rice dish, putting a lot of herbs right at the ends, parsley, basil, whatever. If you're doing Mexican, obviously cilantro or mm -hmm. Asian foods, cilantro, great. I mean- Yeah, I think herbs are really underrated. In fact, lately, leading up to Christmas, I was making- um, kind of this like French style salad dressing. And I was putting some fresh herbs in it and I was using tarragon, parsley. And what was the other thing I was putting in it? It was um, delicious. That's chives. That, yeah. What you, that dressing you made yeah. is so good. So chives, tarragon, fresh parsley. And a lot of times when I make homemade salad dressing, I, I don't put herbs in it. I just do like a Dijon vinegar or lemon juice and olive oil and like garlic. But I noticed that when I add those three fresh herbs to that dressing, it just takes it to a whole other level. And yep. it makes even just like a plain green salad, it makes it taste so much better. No, you're right. And the kids go nuts when you make that dressing. They love it. So uh, that is your best way to find out if like, you're, if you're going to use these flavor enhancers, these are to pull them out for your family, do something yeah. like this. And if they're like, whoa, what did you do to this, mom? What did you do to this, mm -hmm. dad? That's yeah. that's good. And then you add that to your quiver and then you then you know for next time. Yeah, I think like the secret weapon part comes in when it's like, oh my God, this tastes so good, but I can't pinpoint what yeah. what it is. Yep. And that's when you're like, it's my secret. It's my, it's secret, my secret weapon. It's my secret, babe. Okay, next is... And I think this is a great one. Pasta water. Pasta water. Yeah. People go as far as to uh, refrigerate their pasta water. That's a good idea to it, just like have it on reserve. It is because what you're doing is you're just refrigerating starch. Yeah. You just have a lot of starch on hand. So yeah, pasta water, it's, uh, if you know, you know, if you don't know, I'll explain quickly. It can be used to do two things. It can thin your pasta sauce, and it can also thicken your sauce. How can it do both at the same time, Jim? Well, if you have, I'll give you an example. So say you have, you made aglio olio. Well, you use aglio olio again. It's a good one to talk about because what'll happen is if you make this dish, practical real life gets in the way of the the the, the movies, okay? So if you watch the movie Chef with uh, Jean Favreau, he's making this delicious pasta for uh, Scarlett Johansson. She's laying on the bed, okay? And it looks perfect, and it is perfect, but it's only perfect for about 25 seconds. 
She has to be ready to eat it immediately. But the reality of us normal people is that we're not John Favreau or Scarlett Johansson, and we're trying to get our kids to the dinner table. We're trying to just set the table, maybe. We already made it. And the pasta will start clumping and sticking together. That beautiful pasta that you were tossing and flipping and just you had the you had the perfect emulsification. It's five minutes later. It's 12 minutes later. It's dry as all heck right now. Mm-hmm. What do you do? You add some pasta water. That's right. That's right. That you saved in the pot. So yeah. you always pull your pasta out of the pot. Don't, yeah. don't do colander. Now, the way I write my recipes always is... I will always, you'll see this for every pasta, almost every pasta recipe on the Sip and Feast website. It will say, reserve two cups of pasta water or three cups. And it will say next to that in the notes, will not need it all. That it might be ambiguous to some people, but it's actually the best way to write a recipe, bar none. I think I, think I do this better than anybody on the internet, okay? And I do this because it allows for the realities of your life. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that pasta water, it's not the end of the world. You can just use regular water, you know, but it's pull your pasta out of the pot, keep the pot, keep all the pasta water there. And keep it warm. Like keep it on the stove. Yeah, just keep the pot there. On the warm stove. Like turn the heat off, but so that way when you add it, you're not adding cold. Cause yeah, you can add like regular tap water to it, but then you're adding cold water to your hot pasta. By the way, speaking of that, I figured out a way because I'm going to redo the cacio pepe. So it, what they do, I watched a few videos in Italy of these like famous places. They use cold water, but I think they're, I don't know if they're doing this because some of the videos were ambiguous. I think what you do is you, you so when you make cacio pepe, you want to have really starchy pasta water. So you don't use a lot of water in the pot. You pull your pasta, you use in that pasta water, but that pasta water, if it mixes with the finely grated pecorino, it will clump right away. So it's it's can prove difficult. But I think what you do is you have ice cubes on hand and then you add them. After you pull your pasta, you add them to that pot of super starchy pasta water and then it will lower the temperature, still keeping your starch, but cooling it. And then you take that water, that cooled water, and mix it with the cheese instead of just using straight cool water that has no starch in it. Well, it sounds like a, an experiment that you'll have to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to the next one. All right, next is garlic, shallots, onions. Okay, these are used in pretty much all cuisines except for, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure there's something that doesn't use these, but they are the base that are essential and they don't just have to be used as bases. So when you're starting a dish, often you'll saute your onions first, then maybe add your garlic later because onions take longer to cook than garlic. Maybe you just skip both of them and you use shallot, which shallots are kind of a c- cross between an onion and a garlic. Mm-hmm. They're more expensive. They're associated more with like fine cooking. And a lot of home cooks will shy away from using shallots. I think it's like a French ingredient too, Yeah, right? Aren't shallots often used in French cuisine? Yeah, they will say shallot. I really like them. I actually find that w- whenever I make a salad dressing and I add finely minced shallot to it, everybody seems to like the salad dressing a little bit more. And I keep talking about salad dressings, <laughs> I feel like. It's but a good use case for a lot of these is. ingredients. It is. Yeah. So use them all. Uh, there's actually a place right near us, Druthers Coffee Shop. They do crispy shallots for their egg sandwich, right? Yeah. They have an amazing egg sandwich. In fact, they often will win Best of Long Island for Best Egg Sandwich. Um, they do an egg sandwich. It's on a bagel, but it's got crispy shallots and Calabrian chili or something like that, like that combination. And it's fantastic. So good. When they're making these shallots, and I think they, I don't think they do them every day. I think they make like a big batch and then they have them. But when they're making them, the whole outside, the whole parking lot, it's <laughs> yeah. just, it just smells like, a cr- and that's the, that's the problem when you're using like if you're cooking a lot of onions in your home and you don't have ventilation, yeah. it will stink you're up gonna, all of your clothes, yeah. everything. I've left the house many times and I'm like, oh my God, my coat smells like onions yeah. or peppers or whatever it was that you were cooking. Yeah, like if you're cooking uh, uh, pasta pasta genovese, which uses five pounds oh, of onions. Oh, forget it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's move on to the next one. Dried mushrooms. Ooh, dried mushrooms. Okay, I love dried mushrooms. They are so useful. So buy the container at Costco. 
Costco does not sponsor me in any way, but I love Costco and I love telling you what, I love giving you the best tips for getting this stuff. Because if you were to try buy these dried mushrooms, and I'll just give you an example. There's a place near us that sells half ounce bags of dried mushrooms, porcini, shiitake, whatever, they have them. They are $4 or $5 a bag for a half ounce. Costco sells 10 ounces, so that's 20 of those bags. Mm -hmm. Costco sells that for about $10 or $11 that jar. That container, it's like this big, will last you a long time, a long, long time. So what you can do is, now if you take one ounce of those mushrooms out for a recipe, and then you reconstitute them with hot water, it will it will give you a good amount of mushrooms. We just used them actually in the beef marsala that we did. I tried to do it to give more of a blast of flavor, but another great thing to do with these mushrooms is you can make mushroom powder. And often if you go to fancy places, like say Wegmans or Whole Foods or whatever, Fairway, they will be selling this mushroom powder for a very expensive price. You make your own powder, because it's all it is, is taking those dried mushrooms and putting them in a coffee grinder. And then you have your mushroom powder. And then you cool. add that to dishes and it boosts the flavor, the mushroom flavor so much. That's pretty cool. Right? I never thought to use it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to the next one. Smoked paprika. Well, smoked paprika, we spoke about this in uh, episode number, I think, 30, when we were, people thought I was a little feisty about the split pea. Was that episode 30 or was that 31? That was 31. I don't remember, but you were a little feisty. You said that like, it's not it's not going to be good. If... I said that split pea would be disgusting <laughs> without <laughs> having a ham hock in it. Yeah. And you're so wrong. I'm sorry. That's well, not, that's just not right. Seemed that a bunch of people agreed with well, me. No. So it, first of all, you know, I don't like the word disgusting. I mean, <laughs> we shouldn't use that word when we're talking about food because yeah. everybody's taste is their own, I right? Know. What you think is good. Like you are the biggest snickerdoodle fan, right? Snickerdoodles are your favorite cookies. I like a snickerdoodle, but I mean, come on, there's so many better cookies. <laughs> so, a few that. people told me that to like, to like yeah. you're so wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim, you haven't been more wrong about anything. Yeah, but you- it, it, it is the wrongest you've ever been. So you tend to like a cinnamon, I, I noticed you like cinnamon flavor. So that's why you like the snickerdoodle. You like apple pie. Yet I don't ever have to eat apple pie for the rest of my life, and I will be fine with it. But take pistachio gelato away from me, and I will have a big problem with you. Yeah, and I don't have to have gelato ever okay. for the rest yeah, of my like life. Yeah, like I love ice cream. I love yeah. gelato. That's my weakness. So all I'm saying is that everybody has different tastes. Would split pea soup without a ham hock be, quote unquote, disgusting? Absolutely not. It will still be delicious. If... Okay. If you put the smoked, smoked paprika, paprika in there. will make it better, but it can, it can be great without it too. Yeah. So smoked paprika, uh, Tara, listen, we're, we're just joking around here. Uh, <laughs> Tara, smoked paprika, not just for split pea soup, it's also great for uh, chicken paprikash that we're putting up soon. That's right. Oh my God. Right? That, that video what... might come up. Then That's probably going to be the next cooking video that's put out. Who what, was it? Sammy or James? That's a, It might've been Sammy that said it was like one of the best things that you've ever yeah, made. Yeah, and James didn't like it too much. But did he? Didn't he not like it too I, much? I can't, you know what? Everything is blurring together for me. This is the problem of doing this for a living. Yeah. Everything blurs. Well, we filmed and but we I know one filmed of, it a one while of them ago. Really liked it. We maybe been, it was Sammy. Yeah, I, I can't I, I can't remember either. We filmed those a long time ago, the chicken pop across. It's November. And, and it's been um it's been three weeks since we put out a cooking video. We have them all, they're all like done. They're all edited, but we were just kind of just waiting. Like we were taking off a little bit yeah. for the end of December into January. Yeah, and we needed a break. Okay, so that was some of them. We're gonna continue this in the Patreon episode. If you're not subscribed to Patreon, please do. Yes, you have to pay for it, but it's three levels, price levels to fit your budget. We have too many to finish in this one. That's why this this episode would be two hours long then. So we're going to take the, what do we have, 10 more? Yeah, there's a lot more here. And I think we can actually add to it. Okay. I think we came up with this list thinking we were just going to film one podcast. Yeah. But, you know, some of us are a little bit more long-winded than others. I, I was trying to move fast. And I, I know, but still. No, and the other thing is we want to get to questions because okay. we ran out of time. On the Last previous weeks, one. Yeah. And we didn't get to answer questions. So I do have a little bit of a backlog here. Let's let's answer these questions now. These were the questions I actually had prepared for the previous week's 
podcast, okay. but we didn't get to them. Jim, this question comes from Jane. And actually, this question fits in really well with this episode, even though I didn't plan it that way. What are the best oils for frying? I used to use canola, but I have heard it's not really healthy. Avocado oil is great, but it's pricey. Yeah, so Jane, that's, I think, yeah, we we discussed this in the beginning. Did we, it was, this, was this a part of this one we were talking we about talked the oils? About, we talked about olive oil okay. specifically. Okay, so, you know, these things kind of blend together, Jane. And I know I've spoken about people don't really want to use vegetable or canola oil now. It's a lot of negative information about it. And I'm not disputing the science of it. I, I'm not a scientist. So if you don't want to use it, which is, I gather what you're saying, I think peanut oil is probably the one to use. Would you say it's so, Tower? Peanut oil is a really good oil um, for frying because I think it has a high heat point. It also, I think, depends on what you're making. If you're going to make Thai or Indian food, I think you can get away with using coconut oil too. But what is what is she using this for? For frying? She's saying, "What are the best oils for frying?" Yeah. So I assume. I so assume you think she, she means deep frying? I assume you mean deep frying, okay. Jane. So because she needs a lot of oil. Yeah. That's why. Like, if, okay, if she that was, makes sense. Just so you know, like, I mean, again, I don't, I don't know what you know, but you can do shallow frying for a lot of things that maybe you think need to be. Deep fried. Mm -hmm. So cutlets are great to shallow fry. Yeah. There's a lot of other things. Meatballs can be shallow fried. And what do I mean by shallow fried? What what do I mean by shallow fried, Tara? Like an inch of olive oil? Not even. In not a pan? even. Not even. Like a quarter inch. Yeah. You don't need a lot because all you're doing is you're just relying on the oil, the bottom, whatever's on the bottom there, mm -hmm. just to be hitting, and then you just keep turning it. So that's all you have to yeah. do. So it's very economical to do the shallow frying. Mm -hmm. I find that Shallow frying works great for like one batch of chicken cutlets, but if yeah, you're doing you a lot change. of them, but if you're doing a lot of them, you got to keep changing it out, mm -hmm. which, or you have to keep like, kind of like really straining things well, wiping your pan, but it is a much more economical uh, way to use oil. And again, if you're deep frying, I say peanut oil, you could buy a huge box of that at Costco, my favorite place. Uh, P Five Guys uses peanut oil for their French fries. That's and right. a lot of restaurants, uh, places will use peanut oil also. As far as other oils to fry in that are inexpensive, I think, and I'm not positive about this, it could be safflower or sunflower oil, right? That's used there, too? There, yeah, there's both. I think it's safflower yeah. that people use to fry. And then I think sunflower oil, I know a lot of Italian condiments use sunflower oil yeah. to preserve. Like, they do. Like sun-dried tomatoes. Definitely. Will you always see that. Sunflower oil in it. You yeah. See it but I don't the, know if yeah. like I don't know if if that one should be used for frying. Yeah, it's uh it, this is a tough one. I also think you can use your olive oil, Jane, and to fry you know, olive oil's fine to fry at 372. There's a lot of misinformation about this saying the smoke point is you know, it's smoke points higher than that. It's like 450. So you definitely can. Nothing's going to happen if you're frying. Now, it's expensive olive oil, but Costco has a blend where they have, I think it's mostly olive oil, but then part vegetable oil. Yeah. And it's like a Mediterranean blend, yeah, they and call it. If you're not frying fish, then you can strain that oil and use it again. So you can strain your oil really well. You could use a mesh strainer and a cheesecloth on top of it, or coffee filters better, and just let it go through. It will get rid of all of the impurities and you'll have basically brand new oil again for frying. I wouldn't use that oil for other things like for salad dressing. I would pour it back into the container, like an open container and mark for frying second batch. And then I would do it again, maybe for frying third batch. Maybe you get like that much out of it. It's a really economical way to do it. Okay. What do you think about that, Tara? Yeah, I think that's good. I I don't use really. I don't. Frying, I don't frying usually stuff fry turns, stuff. You get you get a in, little intimidated by frying stuff. I don't know if it's intimidating. I don't usually feel good when I eat stuff that's fried, so I try really not to to make it. Some things you just gotta fry though. So say we're gonna do a donut recipe, gotta fry them. Yeah. Say we're going to do um, uh, Zeppelis, like a video for mm -hmm. that, gotta fry them. Yeah. 
Yeah. So then I would go. Rice I would ball. agree with you. I would. I would reach for the peanut. If you have, if you have a peanut allergy, make sure you're getting refined peanut oil because a lot of times the allergy is to the protein, which is not yeah. present in the oil. Um, but obviously consult your medical professional. Yeah. Tara, uh-huh. I mean, most people don't have a peanut allergy. We know about it because we have personal. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why I'm saying it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think peanut oil is a great option and it is somewhat economical more so than avocado oil. You know, that big box of peanut oil in Costco is, is supposedly a good price. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next question. This is from Tom. I have read that cooking foods high in acidity, like tomatoes, in a nonstick pan will damage the nonstick finish. I would be interested in your thoughts on this subject. Tom, I've never heard that it would damage a nonstick pan. I have heard that it will remove, eat away the seasoning of a cast iron pan, but a seasoning on a cast iron pan is just the uh, polymerization of the oil onto the pan that forms almost like this smooth surface. So no, I haven't heard that it will ruin a nonstick. Nonstick coating is typically like a Teflon coating. And the way to remove that, which you don't want to do, is obviously if you use hard tools like metal tongs and stuff and you scratch it by accident. Mm -hmm. But have you heard that it will ruin a tomato? I haven't heard that. I've heard the same thing you did about not using tomatoes in cast iron, which- We've done before, like the Assassin's yeah. Pasta we, we made in a cast iron pan. Well, I don't baby my cast irons at all. I'm not, you know, I, I see it all the time on on Reddit. I, you know, I hate to always be like, you know, talking bad about, you know, I think like the group think on, on there and other, maybe other sites too, is just that my cast iron sh- is like this delicate thing. It's, it's, it's iron, you know, it's like the most undelicate thing in the world. It's... Like they, they, I, I probably have said this in the past. They find iron tools from like 300 years ago that just need the rust to be removed, and they're yeah, and they're working but I think, again. So first of all, it's not that you don't baby it. We do. I think we take pretty good care of the cast iron. We don't ever, like, I would never let a cast iron sit in the sink filled with water to like soak and remove the bits on it. It gets washed immediately. It, we always put. I usually u- actually use like a tablespoon of olive oil to re-season it after it's clean and dried. So the people who baby it, they will not use any soap or any abrasive yeah. material. They will put hot water in the pan, mm-hmm. and boil it. Yes. The contents will come out. They'll mm-hmm. may- maybe they'll like smooth it out with a wooden spoon. It'll come out and then they'll just dry it. Yeah. And basically if you have a real seasoning, mm-hmm. like kind of the way I did the pizza yeah. steel, you will supposedly have a cast iron pan that is smooth enough to cook fish and the fish won't stick. Yeah. No, I've I've heard that too. So But a lot of times like the cheaper cast iron pans like Lodge and like the the no name brands, they will be a little rough. So you'll have to kind of sand that bottom down to get that because they're looking for that smooth like baby's mm-hmm. butt finish, you know, with the oil. Like there's like videos and they put an egg in the pan mm-hmm. and it's like moves around. Yeah. Like kind of like they're trying to make a cast iron to perform like a non Like a non yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom, yeah. thanks for the question. And for all of you out there, we appreciate you listening. I know I mentioned the Patreon early on. It does Don't feel bad if you're not, if you're not, uh, if you don't want to subscribe to it. But that is where we're putting extra episodes. And this one specifically timing we figured there's there's just too much on on the remaining bit of the list leave your questions to podcast at sipandfeast.com tara do you got anything to add no just keep sending the questions over we love them and we love reading your emails and even though if we don't respond to every one of them we do love reading them so thank you and same thing goes for the comments on that you leave on the youtube version of this episode We read all the comments. So basically this podcast has been us starting over again almost in the sense that I wrongly thought that the audience on the cooking channel, that's almost 800,000 subs, was going to want to hear me do a podcast. And that was wrong. Mm -hmm. Right, Tara? Yeah. 
It was wrong. Now, we put those episodes in the beginning. If you recall, the first few episodes of this podcast were on the main channel and people were getting mad. So this is why this is a separate channel here. And the same thing, I wrongly thought that we have almost 2 million people going to our website each month. We thought that by putting the podcast in the main menu, that a lot of people were going to want to listen to the podcast when they were finding us for recipes online. That was also a wrong assumption. Mm -hmm. It's different audiences. Very different audiences. That's what it is. So what I'm trying to say here is we appreciate you yeah. listening to this. We appreciate you watching this, depending on which way you consume this. This is a thing unto itself. Even though it's part of the Sip and Feast universe, mm -hmm. it is definitely a separate entity. For sure. For sure. So if you have friends that you know like to listen to food-related podcasts and you want to spread the word, please do so. We would really much appreciate that. Yeah. But we, we, we try not to be like, I'm trying not to be super blunt about it. A lot of people watching the cooking videos might not even know we have a podcast. I'm not going to like spend five minutes of the cooking video promoting yeah. the podcast. Yeah. So thank you. We will see you, of course, next week. We intend to be doing this for a long time because I said it before, I actually like doing this more probably than anything else we do, Tara. Well, you certainly are very good at talking for a very long period of time. Oh. <laughs> and I know that that might not be what you love the most, but maybe other people do. I like listening. So I think I'm a good, we're like a yin and yang over here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's another thing too. All of this or this might be uh, changing in the not too distant future. We're thinking chairs. Yeah, I would like to be way more casual. I feel like I'm- What you, do you know what these mics? On like the weekend update with yeah. Kevin Nealon. Well, or... these mics are like, you have to like, like I'm constantly feel like I'm leaning yeah. in here. I kind of want to sit in a chair and like have a cup of coffee and be a little bit more cozy. Yeah, if you have ideas for that too, please. Yeah, let us know. Yeah, let us know. We'll see you next time. Thanks.